Hey, welcome back to the only podcast that's recorded by an author who's walking her dog. I'm your host, Jamie Ingle of The Right Ingle, and here you are going to learn tips and techniques to help you write a book that does not suck, because that's our goal as writers, pretty much. So with me is my sweet hound dog, Ahsoka. She'll be co-hosting. You might hear her barking, pooping, running, pulling me, you know, things that dogs do. That's free, folks. I don't charge extra for that. Um, but today I thought we'd talk about the, uh, the elements of setting up a good story. Um, I have been a storyteller since I was seven or eight years old. I used to sit on my pop-pop's lap and he would tell me Hulk stories when I was a little girl. And he'd make up these elaborate tales about the green Hulk and the orange Hulk and the purple Hulk and the red Hulk who was always mean. And I was fascinated by storytelling. And I would say, tell him again, pop-pop, tell him again. And he would for hours. And I would watch the same movies over and over again as a kid. I would watch Grease, Back to the Future, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, Probably that was it. That's probably the only three movies I ever watched. But I would watch them over and over and over again. um, To the point where I even actually wrote down the words of each character speaking. um, And wrote the script out for Grease and half of Alice in Wonderland. No, for Grease... Alice in Wonderland, and half of The Wizard of Oz. Man, I wish I still had those. Those would be fun to read. Maybe I do. Uh, But again, I was learning the structure of of storytelling, the importance of dialogue and storytelling. Um, But it wasn't until maybe six years ago that I went to a SCBWI conference. It's the um, Society of Children Book Writers and Illustrators. And at this conference, I took a class by a guy I'd never heard of before. And he taught a a variation of a concept that he had learned somewhere else. Now, at the time, I didn't realize that um, Chris Grabenstein was sharing a concept from Save the Cat. I'm sure he said it, but when you're learning, you know, you only take in so much. Sorry, guys, my dog just dropped some nuggets while I'm dropping nuggets. It's going to be loud for a second while I tie up her bag. All right. Um, But what this class really taught me was the points and structure of commercial fiction. So before I get into it, if you have not read Save the Cat, you must. It is a screenwriting book, but what it does is it breaks down the beats that each good story should have. And I bet if you go back to your story, you'll see that you do have these beats, or maybe you're missing a couple, and that's where you hit your blocks. Uh, but what it, what it helps a lot with is making sure your story has proper pacing um, for the overarching story. And I know Jessica Brody wrote a book called Save the Cat Writes a Book, which I'm assuming is that same plot point concept, but for authors. I own the book. I have not cracked open the book. So basically, when you're writing a story... You should have your theme stated within the first, I think, five pages. It's really quick. I'm sorry. No, that's with a screenplay. Very quickly, though, within your story, you should have that theme stated. Um, Your theme is going to push that character into the first time they get offered their journey, to which they most always decline or refuse or ignore. But then something happens... And that big moment is going to push them into act two. And they're going to leave act one. So if you're familiar with Hunger Games, the theme is stated right away. We are sitting with Peta, I'm sorry, with Gail and Katniss. And he says to her, we could do it, you know. We could leave, right? That's her very first tease of her quest also. And... Her answer is, we can't leave. I've got my sister and you've got your family. But the whole story is about her quest of leaving and protecting her sister. Her entire mission on this entire series is really her learning that she can't protect her sister. That's her statement in the very beginning. I have to protect my sister. That's my job. So then... The end of, I think it's chapter one even, in Hunger Games. I know where it is in the movie, but I believe it's the very last words in chapter one, too, that push you into act two. 
And that is when Effie reads the card that says, Primrose Everdeen. Because at that moment, Katniss is going on her journey. Like, she is not going to say, dang, you know, when I said earlier that my job was to protect my sister, what I meant was, like, kind of protect my sister, sort of protect my sister, or when it's convenient, protect my sister. No, no, no. We know by the way she treats Primrose, by the way she speaks of Primrose, that Katniss is not going to let her sister go into the games we know she is going to go into the games on her behalf so now we're in act two now at the beginning of act two is where our b story really gets introduced and our b story is that secondary tale that usually has a more inner plot point than a physical plot point So the the physical plot point for Katniss is, uh, you know, she's got to survive the games, protect her sister, right? But her her inner, um, her inner issues are all revealed through PETA. That she's, you know, she's not a selfless person, but in the end, that's what she has to become. So PETA's her B story. He's the love interest. A lot of times your B story is going to also be your love interest. So PETA comes into the story because his name's called, and now they're whooshed off into the train and off to the capital. So Act 2 is really split down the middle into two halves. And within those two halves, you have a midpoint, and that's really the midpoint of your whole story. And your midpoint either has a false victory or a false defeat. So the first half of every good well-written um, act two is called your fun and games. And in your fun and games, that's when Peter Parker realizes he now has powers. So what does he do? He goes from building to building and he shoots out webs and he falls and he makes a silly costume and he gives himself a dumb name, right? Well, in, in Hunger Games, to continue that example, this is the part of the story where Katniss and PETA are in the training center. It's still violent. We still know that eventually they're going to go into the arena. But for right now, it's still safe. They're still practicing. They're still learning the other tributes. And they're trying new weapons and figuring out, you know, the weaknesses of the others, etc. Getting their um, numbers for the um, the people in the capital who like to bet on them and, and give them money and things in the game. It's all safe. That's our fun and games. But then at the halfway point, we're going to hit a moment where there's either a false victory or a false defeat. And that is what's going to push us down into the dark side of our act two. Um, I'm trying to think for the life of me what that is for Katniss. I I think it's her false defeat when she looks down and uh, she goes into the arena, obviously. But when she actually looks down and sees PETA is with the the District 1 and District 2 tributes. Because in that moment, even as a reader or a viewer, we have no clue why PETA has betrayed her and... I think that's our false defeat because PETA actually hasn't betrayed her. It's a false defeat. But what that does is it pushes her into her downward spiral, right? Um, She's separated from everyone. She tries to go off on her own. The capital sees her reaching the edge. They send firebombs at her, right? She gets burned. She climbs a tree. Pete is down there with all the other District uh, 1 and 2 tributes, and they're talking about how they're just going to wait her out. So they go to sleep. She's on fire, right? Girl on fire, uh, which was brilliant, by the way, how, how uh, Suzanne Collins weaved that into every, every moment of Katniss. Um, but anyway, there's a moment there where we see her in the tree, and then we see Rue, right? 
and Rue gives her the advice to cut the tracker jacker hive. Well, now she's tracker jackered. Uh, her and Rue band, right? It's just getting darker and darker. She's lost PETA. Um, she is on her own completely. The Capitol's fully against her, which is not fair. Uh, now she's friends with Rue. Rue and her decide they're going to blow up the food, right? And what happens? Rue gets captured. Rue gets killed. This is her, what's called the dark night moment. We have pushed Katniss. We killed her. Um, I don't think, no, they didn't kill him in this one. Um, we've, we've pushed Katniss as down, far, l- alone, and tormented as we can possibly get her, right? That's what Suzanne Collins did. So she's now in her darkest moment. And in the darkest moment, a few things happen. One, something happens that pushes us into Act 3. And two, the B story gets brought back. And, and three, we have to witness our character overcome something that most people would probably walk away from or give up on. It's that moment of, of giving up right before the solution provides itself. And that is exactly what happens in Hunger Games because at this moment in the story, we hear attention tributes. Two tributes from the same district can win and go home. And she knows she has to find PETA now. So now the very cool thing about flipping from act two to act three is the story problem literally changes because the whole story she has been thinking, I have to get home, I have to get home, I have to win the games, I have to get home, right? She's trying to win the games. Her push into act three is the, it changes the trajectory of her thoughts. And now her mission is we have to get home. We have to win the games. We have to get home. I have to find Peter so we can get home, right? So now act three is her finding Peta and them reuniting. And that is called, well, I don't know what it's called, but that is the moment where you gather the team. And that's what she does. She gathers up with Peta. They come together. They figure out how to get Peta well, right? She goes back into the uh, cornucopia and almost dies. All of these things are building toward our climax. Our climax is literally, she says, <laughs> why is, he goes, why is it getting so dark? As they're heading toward the cornucopia and she said the finale. Like she calls it out. And that's what it is. So after you gather the team, she finds Peta. They're together. And now it's, I've got an idea. I know how we can win this, right? They're heading back to the cornucopia. And that's what you need to be doing in your act three. The, the team has to gather because the hero has the solution. And in the cornucopia is where they defeat Cato and all the mutts. And it's time to go home. Yes, we did it, Peta, right? But no, they change their mind and they say only one of you can go home. And this is your true climax because in this moment, we, and P- I think Katniss too, we do not know with 100% assurity <laughs> that she is not going to take her arrow and shoot him in the face. We don't know this. We hope she won't. And I think she's in that same boat. I hope I won't. And I truly think in that moment, she has a memory of Peter saying, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die my way. They're not going to take me. They're not going to take my soul. And that's when she grabs those berries. And she, Katniss, the hero, makes her heroic choice. And she's the one that does it. It doesn't happen to her. And she hands those berries to Peta and she says, do you trust me? On three, right? That's our climax. And then we hear, no, don't do it. Everyone's ones. Yay. You guys can both go home, right? And the rest of the story is our falling uh, falling action. And that fancy French word that I can never remember, denouncement or I don't know. You can look it up. Um, But that takes us to the very end. And if you... If you plot your books with these plot points in mind, a few things will happen for you. One, you're gonna write commercial fiction. And commercial fiction is what the majority of people buy and understand in their psyche, even if they don't understand why they understand it. (laughs) Um, Two, 
it's going to be easier for you to get through a draft knowing these important points in your story. So really, those are the two reasons why I recommend following this system. Um, I guess the third reason is when you're ready to convert it into a screenplay, you've got all the beats already in place and you've got all the dialogue from the book. So you're kind of ready to go. Um, So anyway, I know this was kind of a long one, but I feel that the structure of your story, if you want to write commercial fiction, uh, if you want to write art, by all means, write whatever, however, whenever you want and create incredibly beautiful prose that nobody will read. And until you're dead, you won't get any recognition for. And if you are writing art for the sake of art, Art Gradius Art, uh, go for it. And I'm sure you'll be successful because your mission is not to uh, have a large audience or even make money doing what you love. Your mission is to create art. So God bless you. It's probably not the right podcast for you, but you're welcome to hang out. For the rest of us, if you want to write books that you can get into an agent's hand and they can sell to a publisher, you're going to want to write commercial fiction. And this is your structure. So when you're done with this podcast, go out and you're going to buy three books. You're going to buy Save the Cat. You're going to buy Save the Cat Writes a Book or Writes a Novel by Jessica Brody. And you're going to buy Write a Book That Doesn't Suck, Aren't You? Because why not? No, I'm just messing. I recommend those three books, though, for you for sure. Guys, you've been amazing. I appreciate you coming by here and let me share a little bit of my knowledge with you. Um, Please like, share, subscribe to this podcast and check out all the podcasts by Space Coast Podcast Network. They're awesome. Um, Join our Facebook group. It's a free community of like-minded authors who come together to share tips and tidbits of writing and writing events so that together we can write more books that don't suck. Um, You can grab a copy of my book, of course. And please let me know what you want to learn. What are you interested in knowing about writing or even marketing? I mean, I'm going to eventually move this into marketing and publicity too, so... Um, just let me know what I can do to help you. It's what I'm here for. And, uh, and that's it guys. Till next time. Happy writing.